Hello, my name is Kobe Scales, Junior Journalism and Communications double major from Virginia. And you are watching the More Conversations podcast hosted by the Andrew Young Center for Global Leadership. Today, I'm sitting down with a track and field legend, two-time Olympian, and an advocate for social change, Dr. Edwin C. Moses. Thank you. Glad to be here with you. Yes, sir. Thank you for being here. All right. So can we just start off, you know, something simple? Can you tell me about your upbringing and um, how you how you ended up coming to Morehouse? I'm from Dayton, Ohio. My family, mother and father, were both educators. I was a, a straight nerd. Um, took five years of math, two years of chemistry, two years of physics, two years of biology. So I was like Urkel, and I was that nerd that everybody uh, came to know in high school. Had no ambitions for track and field, but I came from a very good background and uh, got invited to come to Morehouse on a dual degree scholarship. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And how did you how did you uh, start out running track? I started out uh, in the kids league uh, back in the mid seventies. We have a, a federal program called the Model Cities program, where all the kid had to do was get to the park in the middle of the summer, and you had the teachers who were off of work that were working in the parks. We had basketball team, a baseball team, swim team, even. And we had a pool right next to my house, and uh, the track team. Uh, we used to go down to Cincinnati, Ohio, and my mom used to give me and my brothers like three dollars, and we could enter into an event for 50 cents. So that's how I got started, probably about uh, nine or 10 years old. Okay. Okay. And did track have anything to do with you coming to Morehouse? Absolutely not. My track career was not a budding career when I left high school. My junior year in high school, I was only 5'7", 117 pounds. So mm -hmm. I was a lot smaller than most of the other kids because I went to the kindergarten when I was four versus five. And so when I came to Morehouse, I was straight academics, studied uh, physics engineering uh, in a dual degree program that at the time was with Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a straight academic. I had, I, I was good in track in high school, but not world-class, um, not good enough to get a scholarship to go to any junior college or to go to any school whatsoever. And uh, to be honest with you, I never thought that I would ever go to an Olympic games or anything like that. And lo and behold, I came to Morehouse, walked onto the track team and actually started doing very well. And what would you say attributed to that success that you had um, when you came to Morehouse and you joined the track team? I could have gone, had I had a scholarship, I could have gone to, let's say, UCLA or Ohio State if I had been good enough to go there. Uh, but that would have not been an environment for me to do well in track and field. I did well because it was an uphill fight. We had no track. We didn't have the stadium here at Morehouse. Uh, I ended up jumping fences for five years the entire time I was here at Morehouse, mm -hmm. struggling to find a place to train. And also being around men like myself, you know, coming out of high school and being, being the smartest one in the class, I come here to Morehouse and all of a sudden, uh, you're, you're not an anomaly anymore. You know, there's a bunch of guys around like you and being around that package of great teachers, great acad academicians, and guys that were motivated and just as smart as me. I was just in the right environment for a kid that didn't have any talent at the time. And at the end of the day, what happened to me was that I loved the sport of track and field. And I just stayed in the sport longer than people that were a whole lot better than me. Mm. And by the time I started growing my sophomore, junior year here at Morehouse, I went up from uh, up to like six, one and a half, 160 pounds. And uh, pretty much within the sphere of track and field, if you think of a, a thoroughbred horse, you see the young colts out there, right. you know, they're langley. Uh, they don't have a lot of power, but they grow into racing. And uh, I grew into academics and grew into track and field at the same time. So it was something that would have never happened had I not been right here on Morehouse's campus. I'm, I'm totally convinced of that. I, even with the best coaches in the world, I don't think they would have been able to motivate me the way I was motivated by being here on campus. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And when would you say you knew that you were an Olympic athlete? Uh, you were good enough to complete, compete in the Olympics, not only compete, but to win. When did you say, when would you say you were good enough and you knew that? I always lost until I started winning. Mm. Um, I went to a track meet in 1976. 1975, I performed pretty well. I won the conference, uh, SIAC conference in two events, the 110 hurdles and the 400 meters flat. But, uh, and I run the 400 meter hurdles only once, and it was basically for points. I was just thrown into a meet. So in 1976, um, the coach entered me into the 400 hurdles for the first time. 
he actually told a a, 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 a little lie to get me in a, in a top heat mm -hmm. where he thought I would be competitive. I ran the race and ran a time of 50.1, which qualified me for the uh, Olympic trials in the 400 meter hurdles. And uh, that's when I knew that I had the potential to be in world-class races, but I still didn't know whether or not I had the potential to win. That same weekend, and this was March 26, I'll never forget the date, in 1976, mm -hmm. uh, uh, during a two-day competition, I qualified for the 400 hurdles with a 50.1 time. Uh, the 110 hurdles, I qualified to, for the Olympic trials with mm -hmm. a time of 13.64. And in the 400 flat, uh, my personal best went from 47.5 the year before to 46.1. And the qualifying standard was 46.4. So I had three events that I had the potential to go to in 76, but I picked the 400 hurdles because I thought I could do, being a good high hurdler and a good 400 meter uh, flat runner, I thought that I could do better in that event. And I, I fortunately made the right pick. So up until that point, I had been losing most of the time. Even then I was not winning races. Mm -hmm. And the thing about track and field is that it's a, a sport in which you can measure your performance incrementally. Um, it doesn't take a lot of infrastructure. All you need to do is find a track and shoes. Where, and those are basically the two pieces of equipment I had, jumping over a fence to find a track and uh, you know a pretty decent pair of track shoes. So I really built my own program, um, had my own incentive, um, was studying physics, mm -hmm. which was a very difficult uh, endeavor at the time. And in combination with that, I was getting up at six o'clock in the morning, going out to Adams Park, putting together a training program. And at the end of the day, four months later on July 25th, I not only won the Olympic gold medal, but broke the world record. And uh, that just goes to show you what kind of potential even a young man has at Morehouse College. I was only 20 years old and essentially built a program out of nothing with the help of my teammates, you know, who were studying biology and chemistry and knew the biomechanics of hurdling because we were physics majors. And uh, we did what, what we thought needed to be done. And I was the vehicle for making that happen. Yes, sir. Yeah. And can you expand upon that a little bit? I, I know a lot of people hear the story, um, but could you expand on, on you using your physics major um, to, help you, to help you run and you build in the program um, that eventually, eventually turned you into a, a, a winner? Um, so could you expand on that physics program that you used to help build your, yeah. your track career? When I first started running hurdles in high school, I volunteered. Uh, there's an event called the four by 120 yard high hurdles. Each team has two sets of hurdles, one going down the track and one going up. My freshman year, uh, one of the seniors got injured and the coach asked for volunteers. No one raised their hand. And at the end of practice, I told him I would do it. That's how I started running hurdles. So I didn't have a coach. I never had anybody to teach me to run hurdles, but I learned because I was curious. I loved the event. I, I could see what needed to be done. Uh, but at 15 years old, you kind of have to grow into your body to be able to make it do those things. Fast forward, when I came here to Morehouse, uh, my freshman year, we had a state champion in the 120-yard high hurdles, who's still my friend today, Steve Price, who taught me pretty much everything I knew about running hurdles. You know, he was very efficient. He was a state champion. I met him in Ohio in high school at a track meet. And uh, little did I know that he was going to Morehouse too. So when I got here that freshman year, we would uh, go down to Washington High because that was the closest place for us to uh, really walk to where there was a track. And uh, being that he was a physics student too, we both were very interested in really conquering the hurdles and, 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 and learning about the dynamics. So as we went together through the third and the fourth years in physics, we learned more and more about energy. Uh, our philosophy was that when you're running hurdles, you, you, you're, you're not going up. That's the wrong way to think about it, but you're going horizontal in the direction of the track. And so we began to figure out ways to, to uh, biomechanically get a leg, both legs over the hurdle in the most efficient way possible. And we were both studying quantum mechanics and advanced theories and things like that. Um, basically when we got out of school, we were doing, we both went into, uh, rocket science. We both worked at aerospace. We were doing what the ladies and, um, hidden figures were doing. That mm -hmm. was our classical training, uh, just straight classical physics here at Morehouse. So we had a whole different way of thinking about 
running and efficiency. The human body, my colleagues who were studying biology and chemistry were talking about uh, the, 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 the sugar, muscle, um, glycogen system. So we do about diet, physiology. We were thinking about mechanics from hurdles. All that stuff went into me uh, winning the, the hurdles. But it wasn't just me. It was my teammates as well. And today, they're you know, physicists and IT, um, IT managers, orthopedic surgeons, neurologists. Those are the guys that were on the team with me. Yes, sir. So that's what, that's what made it happen. It's that ingenuity that we had and the hunger that we have for education. Uh, we let that bleed over into track and field. That's, that's what happened. And now I know it was, a, it was quite a long time ago, but can you, could you explain your emotions when you won that, that, first, um, that first Olympic gold medal? Um, my coach at the time, Lloyd Jackson, uh, was really a walk-on coach because they wanted to eliminate the track program. Mm. Uh, they eliminated the swimming and diving program that same year in 1975. So we found a coach, and basically he was a walk-on coach, uh, more like a chaperone. Um, we were pretty cutthroat about training. I was the only one on the, class, on, on the team with world-class uh, ability. And so I had to train very, very differently than every, everyone else. Um, there wasn't any assistance coming from the U.S. Olympic Committee. Uh, the Track and Field Federation wasn't giving any aid. The sport was completely amateur at the time. You couldn't even accept money from someone to help you train, uh, buy track shoes or anything like that, or otherwise you could become ineligible. So when I went to the Olympics, it was a solo effort. And uh, I felt pretty much like, uh, uh, my relationship with the coach was like Muhammad Ali and Bundini Brown <laughs> in the ring. You know, he pumped me up, got me ready, protected me. Uh, so we put a lot of, of, of work into it. You know, we, we dug deep all the way as, as far as you can go physically, physically go. And uh, I had to challenge myself as far as you can go physically. As, and, and in fact, it came out to be more than anyone else had ever done. So when we won, uh, I expected to win. I, I had projected my times that I was going to run uh, almost to the 10th of a second, going from a 50.1 all the way down to 47.6, which was a new world record. And I, I just had everything really programmed in my whole sequential uh, decline in times. And everything worked out. If I said, I, th I think I can run 48.8, I ran a 48.9. When I thought I could run a 48.2, I ran a 48.5. So I had the confidence to know that I was learning about the event. The event. When I won the first time, I remember being so tired, you know, from running all out, like fully all out in the most difficult competition under the most stress ever. And uh, I was more tired than anything else. I knew I was going to win. Uh, I wasn't jumping around like a fish, you know, <laughs> like a, a, a fish out of water. Uh, but I was very happy because I knew that that accomplishment would live for a long time, especially at Morehouse College. Mm -hmm. And you, over the span of about 10 years, um, broke four, four world records and won 122 consecutive races. Um, could you talk about how, how that felt and uh, what, what your mind was going through over, over, that, over that time period? The training program I developed uh, and initially used here in Morehouse, I developed that over probably the next 10 years to make it better. When you're a world record holder, the most difficult thing is achieving a personal best. Mm -hmm. it becomes very hard to do. Uh, most other athletes have a probably 70% higher chance of breaking their own personal best. But when you're the world record holder, for you to, to break your personal best is a new world record. I did it, uh, I ran a new world record in 1977. Um, that was my uh, senior year here at Morehouse. Um, and then I smashed it again in 1980 after I left and went to California and was training out there. That was probably one of my best records because I actually could have run faster. And then in 1983, I, 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 I broke it again. So I knocked a total of eight tenths of a second off of a record, which is uh, a sig significant in a 400 meters. That's, you know, a whole room <laughs> across an, an entire room in terms of distance. So, um, I kept my training program intact. Um, I was very focused. Um, I knew that uh, I was working as an engineer in California full time. 
I wanted to go to medical school. So when it came to track and field, I wasn't uh, playing around with my performance. I wanted to achieve as much as I could as quickly as I could because I knew that I had other options in life as well. And at the same time, uh, track and field was an amateur sport. So there wasn't really a lot of money until uh, like two to three years in my career. And I was one of the people who really forced the sport of track and field to become professional and made the IOC uh, professionalize not only track and field, but all the other sports. So I was out there for selfish reasons once I became good. And once I became good, first big race that I run was the Olympic Games in 76. That was my first international race. After that, I became addicted to winning, and uh, that's when I, I stopped losing. You know, I think I lost about another three races in my career, but uh, I was really interested in high performance and also being an achiever from an HBCU, of which there were many in the Olympic Games, uh, in my event and other events as well. So I wanted to um, just do the best that I could, and, and I knew that the longer that I won, the longer that I was successful, that Morehouse was going to accrue some benefits uh, behind that. And uh, I think in 1984 or 86, one of those two years, they finally built a stadium and a track at Morehouse, which was always a dream. I always visualized the track being exactly where it was mm -hmm. uh, when I was in school. There used to be a steakhouse right over there by the goalposts and uh, neighborhoods uh, all back in, in the area where the Ray Charles Center is and the track. And I always visualized that we ought to have a track right there. And so I was incentivized to continue to do well to, to help make that possible. Yes, sir. And we're going to come back to that, to, to the uh, track and field that is now in your name. Um, but first, you said you, you, you were out there running for selfish reasons, but you're known as an advocate for social change. Um, you talked about getting, getting uh, track and field sport from, and not only track and field, but from an amateur sport to a professional level sport. Um, but you also you also did all of this winning um, without any performance enhancing drugs, the PEDs, as they call it today. Um, and you're a social you're 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 an advocate for anti doping. Um, could you speak a little bit towards that um, and not only your your experience and success without um, performance enhancing drugs, but why you wanted to be an advocate for change for that? Well, I didn't have anything. I grew up basically you know, in the hood when it comes to facilities and 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 things that you need to become a world-class athlete. And my first Olympic Games in 1976 was when uh, we were still in a situation of Cold War. It was United States versus Russia, East Germany, Bulgaria, Poland, Hungary, all the different countries uh, that were in the communist bloc. And they were notorious for using substance, uh, substances, uh, performance-enhancing drugs. And I never forget the way that the American women, we had some of the, the most talented women on the earth, but none of them won a medal except in the relay because the East German girls and the Russian girls and the Bulgarian girls just, and the Polish girls just rolled over them and they were all taking performance enhancing drugs. So I just thought that that was wrong. I was a world-class 400 meter hurdler, but standing next to some of those women, they had bigger pecs, bigger arms, biceps, legs more cut than me. And I was looking at these women and saying, what the heck is going on here? And so, uh, because I grew up without, I always thought that something's got to be fair. You know, if I can go out there and win, which I did for many, many years clean, then other athletes ought to be able to do that as well. And so for me, the, the concept of using drugs to enhance your performance it was just straight cheating, and I wanted to make sure that athletes that did not want to take them would have a fair shot and would not have to compete against the others. So that's why I became involved in anti-doping. And uh, the models that we started then became uh, the World Anti-Doping Agency today and the United States Anti-Doping Agency, which uh, I was a chairman of for 10 years yes, sir. and did a lot of work in that area. And also we did a lot of work, uh, women, uh, they had no respect for women athletes back in the NCAA. There was this, I don't even know if there was basketball for women back then. I don't think so. It was virtually no sports for women, gymnastics, maybe swimming. Um, maybe some schools had volleyball, but there was no women's athletics. So we had to fight for women's athletics as well. And also, uh, when it came to, to women's rights, there was a, uh, there was a need for someone to be an advocate for women of color. 
because the women of color weren't getting the opportunity as, uh, at that time either. Uh, there was a lot of white women that were scrambling for the positions at the top. And I had to raise my hand up and say, look, you know, there's a lot of black women, Hispanic women, Asian women out here that, 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 that you guys don't even consider. So I fought for that. And also for uh, before um, the Paralympics became the Paralympics, they had a, a federation. I fought for their rights also to compete in track and field when a lot of Olympic athletes did not want them to compete and didn't think that they were real Olympians. It, that was the way that they put it. So I fought for all that. In addition to, you know, fighting and standing up for myself as an African-American man in his mid twenties, you know, fighting against what, well, uh, attacking some of the policies with, that were there, but that's what you learn. And that's what we do when we come from Morehouse. So I was in my comfort zone, but I didn't have a lot of backup at that, at that point in my life, because there were no very few black commentators doing sports, hardly none. Um, very few writers from the, from the uh, big magazines, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, uh, LA Times. There were no black reporters. Uh, everyone was white. And so I thought it was my job to represent myself as an athlete from an HBCU and a scholar, an academician, all the time. Yes, sir. And so you spoke a lot about the resources that you did or didn't have um, in your time here in Morehouse. What inspired you and what made you want to put your name on the track and help rebuild the track and field? And I got here my freshman year and I was actually in the process of being built. And I'm a junior now and it's finally finished a, bit, a beautiful piece of work. And uh, we're going to have the Morehouse Relays come back to come back to Morehouse. Uh, but what made you want to make ensure that we had a, a fresh track and uh, fresh track and field for athletes, scholar athletes to run on here at Morehouse? It wasn't just me. Uh, the person who really made it possible for me to go to the Olympic Games was Dr. Hugh Gloucester. He was the president when I was here. Uh, the athletic department, we had run out of money. And when I qualified to go to the Olympic trials, my coach and I were pretty much independent, but we had to go to California and Oregon to compete in these uh, national championships and qualifications for the trials. So I went to uh, Dr. Gloucester and told him the story. He knew that I had qualified for the Olympic trials, but no one knew what was involved. And Dr. Gloucester found $3,000 in cash, gave it to us to pay for plane trips, rental cars, hotels, food. And, uh, and, and he had the vision for building a track here one day after I went to the Olympics. He said that we're going we're gonna to find the money, we're going to do something. And eventually, before he left, he was the president who was here when we, we uh, inaugurated the track. So I give a lot of credit to Dr. Gloucester for having the vision after I did what I did and being proud of my accomplishments to really make it happen. Yes, sir. And thank you so much for being here. What, what, what advice would you give to young scholar athletes um, here at Morehouse and HBCUs around, around the country um, as they in, pursue their endeavors to the different sports in the sports world? Uh, what advice would you give? Scholar first, athlete second. Um, the days are over uh, when the average uh, athlete in high school is going to be on a professional team. It's probably like a tenth of 1% of all the athletes, but there's a lot of occupations, jobs, positions you know, within the C-suites of these professional teams, uh, marketing, law, running organizations, there's just a, a much more opportunity off of the field than there is on the field. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Edwin C. Moses. And thank you, viewers, for watching the More Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Toby Skills. Have a good one.